Welcome to Bethany Lutheran in Warren, Oregon. Today I'm preaching on Psalm 32. Happy are those whose transgression is forgiven, whose sin is covered. Happy are those to whom the Lord imputes no iniquity and in whose spirit there is no deceit. While I kept silence, my body wasted away through my groaning all day long. For day and night your hand was heavy upon me, my strength was dried up as by the heat of summer. Then I acknowledged my sin to you, and I did not hide my iniquity. I said, I will confess my transgressions to the Lord, and you forgave the guilt of my sin. Therefore, let all who are faithful offer prayer to you at a time of distress. The rush of mighty waters shall not reach them. You are a hiding place for me. You preserve me from trouble. You surround me with glad cries of deliverance. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. As I studied the four scripture text for this Sunday, the Lord reminded me that good people sitting in church pews or watching a sermon online, need to hear the words of forgiveness as much as those others out there in the world. Now, what do I mean by that? I mean, as good Lutherans, we all know that we have all sinned and fall short of the glory of God. And we know that Jesus died for those sins. But sometimes we forget that all sin is of evil conviction. There is no, no truth to justifications like little white lies or stretching the truth. And we have trouble believing that cheating on taxes is just as bad as grand larceny. Or running down a person's reputation is as bad as manslaughter. We really would prefer that God grade on a curve. Now, that we all feel scummy and depressed, the Spirit of God leads us to Psalm 32. Now we know Psalm 32 was written by David. Most scholars believe that it was written in the midst of his guilt when he tried to cover up his affair with Bathsheba, but before the crime was exposed by the prophet Nathan. David did not want his scenario to happen to anyone else. So he writes this psalm about confession and forgiveness to teach and counsel his people, and now us. I think we can break down this psalm of confession and forgiveness into four key points. First, there is joy in forgiveness. The psalm starts with, Blessed is the one whose transgression is forgiven, whose sin is covered. Blessed is the man against whom the Lord counts no iniquity, and in whose spirit there is no deceit. There are four different Hebrew terms for sin used in this psalm. Pesha, translated transgression in verse 1, has the basic idea of rebellion. The second term is hata'ah, translated sin, a more general term referring to a deliberate offense. The third term, awan, translated iniquity or sin, conveys the idea of going astray. The fourth term, ramia, translated deceit, emphasizes falsehood or even hypocrisy. The Hebrew word asher, translated here as blessed, 
is probably more accurately translated as joyful or happy, a sense of joy and satisfaction in the circumstances. However, it is even more than that. It's a sense of going straight. There is intention and determination in this word, a way of life chosen and lived. This would be the different life that Paul mentions in 2 Corinthians. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. The old has gone, the new has come. All this is from God, who reconciled us to himself through Christ and gave us the ministry of reconciliation, that God was reconciling the world to himself in Christ, not counting men's sins against them. Also, there are different aspects of forgiveness. In verse 1, forgiven is literally lifted up and covered, means to hide or cover something which is offensive. So we have how joyful is the one whose rebellion is lifted off him, whose deliberate offense is covered up, no longer to be seen. Joyful is the man for whom the Lord does not count his straying against him, and in whose nature there are no lies or hypocrisy. The highlight of our weekly worship service is that moment when we hear the absolution, the assurance of God's pardon, when God's grace and mercy is poured over us, giving us the wonderful joy of being restored as a blessed child of God. God's forgiveness is radical. It changes us. It can change the world. Second, silence brings suffering. Verses three and four. For when I kept silent, my bones wasted away through my groaning all day long. For day and night your hand was heavy upon me. My strength was dried up as by the heat of summer. The language in these verses is not metaphorical. Long before contemporary psychology understood the effects of repression, the psalmist knew clearly that unresolved guilt can have serious physical consequences. The famous psychiatrist, Dr. Carl Menninger, called for a retrieval of the concept of sin, and he suggested that the clergy should take the lead. He said it is their special prerogative to study sin, or whatever they call it, to identify it, to define it, to warn us about it, and to spur measures for combating it and rectifying it. Well, actually, Dr. Menninger, that was already done centuries ago. Hear the psalmist. My bones wasted away, my groaning all day long, my strength was dried up. The heavy hand of God in verse 4 is that heavy feeling, that burden and shame of the unconfessed sin. That feeling in the pit of our stomach when we know our words and actions hurt another and that our sin hurt God. The ulcers and migraines, the insomnia and depression from the stress of not being right with God and with one another. Third, confession brings forgiveness. Verse 5. I acknowledged my sin to you, and I did not cover my iniquity. I said, I will confess my transgressions to the Lord, and you forgave the iniquity of my sin. The real problem in Psalm 32 is not the sin, but rather the failure to acknowledge and confess the sin. Notice it takes three lines to confess and one line for God to forgive to lift the guilt of sin. We have to turn away from sin. We have to turn back to God. And we have to make ourselves vulnerable before God, standing before him spiritually naked. 
no more pretense, no explaining away or justifying, but rather banking on God's mercy being wider than his anger. This is not simply reciting the confessing part of the Sunday morning liturgy. It's time for a deep, honest, personal confession of sin to God. 1 John 1 verse 9, if we confess our sins, God is faithful and just and will forgive our sins and purify us from all unrighteousness. God forgives us not because we confess our sins, but because Jesus' blood and righteousness cover that sin. The silence of the unconfessed sin is the rejection of grace. Fourth, forgiveness brings relief. Verses six and seven. Therefore, let everyone who is godly offer prayer to you at a time when you may be found. Surely in the rush of great waters, they shall not reach him. You are a hiding place for me. You preserve me from trouble. You surround me with shouts of deliverance. The floodwaters representing the overwhelming trouble or disaster the psalmist was facing was the, from the result of sin. If you remember, committing adultery with his best friend's wife was just the start of King David's trouble. Next came the cover-up. David resorted to having his friend killed as part of his effort to cover up his sin. The king was drowning in his multiple sins. But God would not give up on David. He sent the prophet Nathan to confront David with the reality of his sin and his need for forgiveness. Did you hear that? God wants to forgive you. That is why he sent his son to die for us. But we have to bear ourselves before him. We have to drop all excuses, our self-justification, our cover-up attempts, and ask for that forgiveness. In scripture, we also saw Adam and Eve try to hide their iniquity from God. We saw Jonah try to run and hide from God when he disobeyed God's, God's command to preach to the Ninevites. In current times, we see a once famous attorney now facing legal charges because he helped a past president in several cover-ups. We see a recent past president's name and reputation dragged through the mud because of a cover-up regarding the payment of money used as a cover-up for moral indiscretions. In the Watergate scandal during the Nixon era, the break-in was not that serious of a crime. The issue that led to the president's resignation was his, his attempt at a massive cover-up of the crime. As verse seven tells us, God will protect us from trouble. Now there will probably still be some legal repercussions, and we may need to offer apologies or make restitution. But God will protect us from sin's permanent claim on us. His forgiveness may be the greatest power in our life. Without it, all relationships we depend on would be lost. Thankfully, God is as consistent to forgive as we are consistent to sin. Proverbs 28, verse 13. He who conceals his sin does not prosper, but whoever confesses and forsakes them finds mercy. Forgiveness brings relief, and the feeling of relief is as strong as the weight of dread. God is described as a hiding place because God protects us from our own actions. He delivers us from ourselves. This psalm started with being joyful because our sins are forgiven. And it ends with, Be glad in the Lord and rejoice, O righteous ones. 
Shout for joy, all you upright in heart. Happiness begins with the reality of grace. The confession of sins is nothing more than humble act of faith in God's grace in Christ. But we must decide that we want to live and die in our efforts to cover up our sin, or will we live now and forever covered by the cleansing blood of Jesus? Let us pray. Forgiving God, we come to ask you to remove this sin-inspired weight from our life, spirit, and soul. Restore and renew our faith and trust in you. Lord, we acknowledge that our silence before you is the sin that we cling to. We give you thanks that you listen to our prayers, that you willingly forgive us, and you restore the balance in our relationship with you and with others. How reassuring it is to know that you not only forgive us our sinfulness, but also promise to teach and guide us on the best paths for our faith and for our faith community. Accept our thanks for all you have been to us in the past and all you will be in the future through the love and sacrifice of your son, Jesus. Amen. Mm -hmm.